and welcome everyone to this episode number five in our Education 4.0 series with friends at JISC, looking at the changing world of education in the fourth industrial era. It's been fantastic to hear from some of you as the series progresses. Listener Yedrick got in touch to share his message of support from the south of France. Hi Sophie, it's Yendrek. I have been your listener for well over two years now. And I listen to your show usually while cycling around Provence in the south of France. I live far away from all the tech hubs and events that you go to. And the EdTech podcast allows me to keep in touch with what I think is one of the most fascinating fields of modern economy and modern life in general. So thanks a lot. I want to tell you that your mission to connect the tech with educators is a truly noble one. Working in education myself, I'm worried about technology, you know. I'm worried about the specific side effect it generates, namely the technological thinking that is treating everything and everybody like resources, not as ends. But uh, technology means also great opportunities. I'm fully aware of that. And seen through the eyes and minds of the fantastic guests that you have on the show, I feel more reassured. So thanks a lot for that, Sophie. I'm heading now to patreon.com to support your show. It definitely deserves it. And I wish you and all the listeners uh, a great, great day. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Yedrick. It's a real pleasure to hear that you're enjoying the show. And thank you for all of your support. The idea of technology's benefits versus a more pervasive technological determinism comes up again at the end of this week's episode in my conversation with Dr. Dominique Thompson. And I think more and more it's essential that we question how we are using technology and to what depths. Great to hear from you and you're certainly winning at life if it involves cycling, the south of France and the EdTech podcast. So well done. Hello also to Ahmed Yeme listening in from Nigeria. Hello guys, my name is Ahmed Yeme from University of Medjugorje, Borno State, Northeastern Nigeria. I am a university lecturer, educational technology specialist. We train teachers and uh, student teachers, does teachers to be on the use of educational technology facilities, ICT in education, and uh, train them on the different teacher methods. So I am very excited to uh, I get myself in touch with your platform and the innovative uh, podcast you've been sharing about the future of education, especially artificial intelligence, blended learning, and learner-centered approach. It is actually interesting. Looking forward for more interesting packages. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Hello also to Chris Skidmore, MP, Minister of State for Universities, Science, Research and Innovation here in England from the Department for Business, Energy and the Industrial Strategy to share this update on the EdTech strategy. Technology is a vital part of learning in any school, college or university and can act as a catalyst for those who learn and those who teach. Our EdTech strategy, uh, realising the potential of uh, technology education, helps to do just that. Last week, I spent some time with leading education and technology experts at the first meeting of the EdTech Leadership Group, chaired by Lord Chris Holmes, uh, one of the UK's most successful Paralympians. The group will be leading the way in championing the objectives of our strategy. I know that Chris is passionate about the role technology can play particularly with its potential to boost accessibility and inclusion in classrooms and lecture theatres. And we're also working in partnership with Nesta, the Global Innovation Foundation, on several of the challenges we outlined earlier this year. The partnership will see £4.6 million being used to support edtech innovation in schools and colleges. The first step began last week with a call out to tech companies as part of the edtech innovation fund to kickstart innovation in the industry and support the development of edtech products. In addition, we are set to launch a network of demonstrator schools and colleges across the country, which will help showcase best practice. We know that the EdTech strategy is not a silver bullet to all the issues faced by education providers, but I see this as just the start of the conversation. Thanks for that, Chris, and I hope we can get you on as a guest for our new podcast series on adult and vocational education launching in September. 
And finally, thanks to Stuart Allen, who also got in touch to connect with past listener Sunny Tan. Hey Sophie, how's it going? This is Stuart here. I'm a new listener to your podcast and absolutely blown away by it. Thank, I'm really glad that I stumbled across it. I'm particularly, uh, I just listened to the last episode that came out and I just want to say hi to Sunny Tan, who has an interest in technology within the uh, Chinese public school context. I've been living and working in China for the last 17 years, taught thousands of hours within public schools and also have a big interest in learning technology, AI in in language learning and flip classrooms as well. It's, it's a huge passion of mine. And so, yeah, just want to say hi and thank you to you, Sophie, for such a wonderful podcast. I want to say hi to Sunny. Uh, it seems that we have similar interests. And, yeah, keep up the good work. I can't make it to EdTechX in London, but some people from our team are going to be there. So, yeah, just saying hi and uh, once again, keep up the good work. Take care. Thanks, Stuart. And I'll be sure to connect you with Sunny so that you can carry on your conversation after this episode. And thanks to all of the listeners this week who shared their messages. Our next episode in the Edgy 4.0 series after this one will be on pioneers and settlers who are affecting change in further and higher ed. Ultimately, who can help embed new technologies and working practices? If that speaks to you or you're listening in and want to say hi, why not message us for inclusion in the next episode by going to speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast and leaving a 90 second voicemail. Wherever and whenever you're listening in, I hope you are very well and thanks for joining us. This week's episode is all about the personal curriculum. We're horizon gazing with Natalie 4.0 bringing things back to the present day with Ada the chatbot at Bolton College and thinking about where pastoral care and the role of the mentor fits into personalised learning by chatting to Connect to Teach and past GP Dominic Thompson. Now, one of the questions we're asking today is, could AI underpin truly personalised learning? In past episodes of the EdTech podcast, you would have heard Professor Rose Luckin talk about the promise of a cognitive assistant from the cradle to the grave, or Kristen DeSherbo talking about learning analytics, which truly know your motivations and limiting factors to nudge your curriculum forward in a way which speaks to your own quirks and neurosis. But you may have also heard some of our more recent episodes, which seem to herald a more hybrid approach to personalised learning noting the less speedy but more sustainable learning curves where individuals look up and connect with their peers. It's in this vein that we start this week's episode and explore what the personal curriculum might mean in reality. A reality where we can both forge our own path aided by technology, but without feeling isolated. To kick off, let's put our Imagining 10 Years into the Future hats on. Here I am doing the very same at this year's DigiFest, where I had the chance to put myself in the footsteps of Natalie 4.0, an immersive VR experience of a student set 10 years in the future, where personal curriculum can mean anything from international collaboration in the front room to tutor one-to-ones in person and on campus, as and when it's needed and depending on our immediate needs. Here's a little glimpse. Okay, so I'm in the Natalie 4.0 or 4.0 feature at DigiFest, and there's lots of ethereal music here. And I'm here with uh, with Mark Lennon. Mark. Yeah. And yeah, we're just going to try out this uh, experience. So bear with us. <laughs> Can you explain what Natalie 4.0 is and and how this has come about with with JISC and DigiFest? Yeah, sure. So Natalie 4.0 is a student really in the future so in 10 to 15 years time and this VR experience is looking at a day in the life of her so in this VR experience you are you are Natalie and it's sort of looking at the different technology she uses as a student how she interacts with people how things have changed really and and how was this put together is this entirely something that JISC has put together or is it in, with partners who have helped kind of create this vision uh it's with it's with some partners as well it's with uh, make real so okay with make there. real yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay <laughs> oh, yeah so if you take a seat yeah. once you do that it should start but let me know what you see and we can sort that then throughout it you're going to use this controller to sort of move about like that and this to select okay. so throughout it you get multiple options about the path you want to take 
where you want to do what you what you want to do okay. the experience. So um, it'll make more and sense. Does this vary dependent on which thing you select? So yes. You, yeah. Okay. So so there's one part where you can either go on a field trip and go on an interactive VR experience, or just stay in the classroom and sort okay. of do do more of the standard. Okay. Sort of interesting. So, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. The headphones are coming on. Ooh. There you go, and that's for your sound. So okay, wow. Be good. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm in my bed, it looks like, and I'm putting on some Ray Ban type glasses, and the alarm's going off. And there's my hands. Oh, look, I've painted my nails. That never happens. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yep, morning. Would you like me to let Abdul in education welfare know that you're sleeping better and feeling less stressed now that your fourth assignment has been completed? Okay, so it's offering me the option to message Abdul about my sleeping pattern or just refer that to Ada, who I guess is our chatbot. So I'm going to say, Ada, you can handle it. The notes you took the research earned you 50 credits. And you need to get another 65 in the final assignment to be on target. Your first lecture today starts at 10 a.m. So it's now t turning to 8. I've just been told what credits I need to keep on track with my... Uh, Degree or equivalent, and now it's nine o'clock. Oh, oh dear, I'm falling behind in my geography course. So I can either do my digital resources or have a call with my tutor. Well, let's have a call with my tutor. Hope I don't get told off. I'm sat at home. Oh, look, it's a hey, lovely. Hope you're well. My tutor. So I was going over some of your stats earlier, and it looks like you might be struggling with some of the coursework. Um, I can't go into it now because I've got to rush into my lecture, but I'm sending you some VR resources now. Have a look at them um, this morning if you can. I think they'll be very helpful. And uh, yeah, let's we'll catch up later today. <laughs> Okay, so Hologram, my tutor, telling me what I should do to catch up and uh, offering a face-to-face -face later on. Seems all right. Wow, so I'm in the front room and now there's some VR mode going on. Would you like to make a field trip to Nomad Games? Would you like to take part in a workshop session with our international director? Uh, well, let's go international because not always the chance to go international at workshop. It's good to see everyone. So that was all taking place in uh, my home, which was great and very convenient. Oh, it's Peppa the robot. So Peppa the robot is offering me uh, the, to show me the route to my desk um, uh, and just ask me to look at her directly while she scanned my face. So I'm going to say, no, I know the route so that I keep some geographical skills at least. <laughs> Whoa. Massive dog. Okay, with that idea in mind, let's reel back to the present day. Now, there is multiple work happening on chatbots in education in the UK. But if you haven't heard of Ada the Chatbot coming out of Bolton College, then what have you been doing? They've won every award going and recently won the praise of the Secretary of State for Education, Damien Hines, for showing artificial intelligence at its most beneficial. I quote, freeing tutors to spend more time on teaching and less time on paperwork. Here's the dream team, Aftab and Dean, talking me through the evolution of their chatbot over the last few years, from student FAQs to staff support and learning resources assistant. 
So yeah, really excited. I am here with Aftab Hussein, learning technology lead at Bolton College, and also with Dean Bagley, who is the systems development lead at Bolton College. And no doubt you would have come across their work, which is now pretty famous around the Ada chatbots in the sector. So yeah, just wanted to take some time to to understand really the context in which you're working. So uh, Bolton College, and just to find out a little bit about how Ada the chatbot is doing. So I think two years in this April, and now that you've got a kind of star facing chatbot as well, and we can we can talk a little bit about that, and then also. So the education 4.0, and, and we'll have some questions there. I'll give this to you, after. So I guess a broad question, first of all, what's got your interpretation of education 4.0? Our interpretation is that we've had many problems that educational institutions like schools, colleges and universities had for centuries or decades. And also as well, there are many problems that are relatively new. And those new problems are around data explosion, around personalised learning, the need for on-demand learning. So the traditional problems are retention, completion, progression. We're used to those, but with the emergence of increasing levels of data and complexity and personalisation and students wanting access to learning at any time of the day and at any time in their lives, we need new technical solutions to address those problems. And it's an interesting one, because if I understand correctly, you've been in this space for over 20 years. And so, you know, you do see these sort of cycles of things coming around. But do you think it's fair to say there's a renewed sense of urgency around the relationship between technology and learning at the moment? And do you think that that urgency is something that we should pay attention to? Or is it something that you've seen before? And It reminds me of the early web back in the early 90s. And uh, I used to work in colleges then, and we were designing virtual learning environments uh, for the very first time. So you couldn't go to a vendor and purchase a, a subscription for a VLA or a learning management system. So we had to create them ourselves. But in, in those days, we saw the potential of the web and how the web could support teachers and their students at any institution. But the problem with the web in those days, and for the last 20 years, is that it hasn't really delivered a personalised services it's delivered uh, ubiquitous access. Uh, you can access college services at any time of the day, any time of the year. Uh, but the level of personalisation and contextualisation has been missing. And with the advent of cognitive services or AI, and, with the, and in conjunction with data, then we're getting a, a new breed of services that deliver contextualisation as well as personalisation. And these services allow us to uh, solve all these problems in a very fundamentally different way. So, for instance, you had a learning management system in the past and the learning management system would have delivered the same content to all the students in a class, regardless of background and context and how well the students were doing. Now, with the advent of uh, analytics and machine learning, you can deliver a very personalised journey. So when students go onto a learning management system, each one of them logs in, the services draw on that data and they base the teaching and learning and assessment materials that are presented to that student on that data set around that student. So every student in a college or in a class will get a very personalised journey. Just having a play around with, with Ada, the chatbot, mm. I guess what I quite like about it is it's, it's quite discreet. So, you know, you can have it in the corner there and you're just mm. sort of asking it questions. Because ultimately, it's, it's sort of similar to how you might seek out the search function in a website and ask a question. But is it quicker in the replies? And obviously it's not, you know, you're not having to then navigate a whole page of information. It's just the section. I don't know if this is one for Dean. Uh. Yeah, it's interesting that we've been able to utilise these technologies to solve a complex problem in quite an elegant way. And basically complicated queries and accessing significant amounts of data and cross-referencing data and diving into databases are made much easier via natural language. So you can ask Ada a simple question and get the results that you want quite easily without having to utilise more powerful graphical user interfaces. Uh, Speaking to computers isn't new. Early pioneers back in the 50s and 60s like JCR Laclida, Douglas Engelbart and the IBM Shoebox Voice First Service were around in the 50s and 60s. So people were always asking themselves, how would we connect and communicate with network devices in the future. So it, it is an old problem, 
and it's one that's been examined for a few decades now. But it's only recently, in the last 10 years, where we've seen the advent of new services. We've seen digital assistants on smartphones Mm -hmm. like Siri or Katana and Google Assistant. And uh, in the last four or five years, we've also seen the advent of Alexa. And these services demonstrate that natural language is the way forward. Mm -hmm. And we're not necessarily tied to a traditional graphical user interface. We're not restricted to typing in our questions uh, onto a keyboard. We can use our voices to speak to our machines. Which is quite liberating because I get extremely frustrated that, you know, every time you have to get into your phone, if you don't use your thumb, it's like, you know, you're typing in, you're swiping. There's like a big advantage to the user experience if you're using voice, isn't there? If you can use your voice, obviously, is the big one there as well. It's an evolving natural way of interacting with computers. And although the demonstration that we've done uh, a few minutes ago uses typing, we do have voice platforms which allow you to very succinctly and accurately get information out of computers and guidance, more importantly for the student, that they would otherwise have to go and search for. It's ubiquitous access and it's access uh, 24-7 as well. And did you develop this from scratch? We did. There are components of it that um, are powered by IBM Watson. Okay, yeah. Um, but the, well, the web clients, the Alexa clients, the mobile phone clients the APIs and the connection to our campus data set we did ourselves. And what's the future for Ada the chatbot? What do you see? I mean, I, I know I can see you already, have, you know, I've followed your work online and then I can see here that people are already kind of gravitating towards asking you questions about it. Are you having other universities and colleges want to partner with you to help roll something out? Is that something that you're going to be doing? Uh, in terms of the future for the service, we see it as three stages. The first one, where Ada acts as a chatbot and she's able to answer uh, contextually to -to day-to-day questions and inquiries around the campus. The second stage is when Ada starts emerging as a digital assistant and she starts supporting the uh, teachers and students and the support teams with day-to-day activities and workflows. So this is where Ada will start doing things for you around the campus, like, for instance, advising you about the assignment grade that you need or advising the students they've got a work experience coming up next week or they need to get such and such a grade to increase their grade average. Mm -hmm. And also as well, if a student is struggling with their studies, Ada could quite easily recommend an appointment with their subject teacher or with a learning support team. And if the student consents to that, Ada could arrange that meeting between those appropriate people on the campus. So so this is the future. Then uh, the third stage is when... Ada starts to learn to get better at what she does using machine learning and all the data sets. So if she's recommending students to get a high grade on the next assignment and if she's learning how to say it, so maybe the way she says it and, and uh, in, a, in a timely way will inform her behaviour in the future. So, for instance, if a student is a level three student who could go to university but at the present moment in time isn't getting the grades that are required mm-hmm. to go to uni, Ada could nudge that student, so by the time the academic year ends, the student's got enough UCAS points to actually apply for uni. If that happens and Ada improves her advice and guidance to the students, one of the really exciting opportunities is that progression could rise, average grades on a course could rise, and hopefully you get more students entering further studies or training as well. So I, I love that idea. I guess like traditional nudges face to face, you know, if, you, if you're nudging someone to get the mm. next grade up, you could see, OK, maybe there's a bit of chink in their armoury, like something's not quite right and they're under pressure. This is amazing. But how do we also build in the, the kind of factoring in for people being at different points of their life, perhaps under different pressures at different stages and, and making sure that it becomes a, a notification for good as opposed to like another kind of microaggression? Notifications are designed and tailored and tweaked by everyone on the campus. So teachers will inform the behaviour of those nudges. And if we design them well, then we're able to reflect the different conditions that a student is in. So, for instance, if we know that a student is at risk, then that will inform the behaviour of those nudges. Mm -hmm. Nudges are very different from traditional notifications. Uh, Notifications are, are typically saying, here's a date for an assignment, this is your hand in date. Don't forget, you've got an exam. But it doesn't really respond contextually. Right. So with context, the nudge could say, right, I know you're a level three student. I know you want to go to uni, but I know you're also at risk. 
there's a danger that if that's I uh, cool. push you too hard, mm. that that's going to tip you over. So if the nudges are informed and behaviour is directed by everyone on the staff, then hopefully we'll get some good outcomes. So, so it's understanding the motivations of the student as well. And, yeah, and, and, and also the uh, aid of service should direct the student to a member of staff. So that could be the learning development mentor, subject teachers or the counselling team. So uh, appropriate guidance can be given. AIDA doesn't act alone. AIDA is part uh, of a suite of services and a group of people that are uh, there to support every student on the, uh, in the college. Yeah. And is voice technology and sort of natural language processing one of the f- sort of future or existing technologies that you're most excited about in regards to sort of learning and supporting learning? Yeah. Natural language understanding, generation, processing. It's not, it's not a recent technological development, but we're seeing advances and we're seeing them in such a way that the big companies like IBM and Amazon uh, put in these these technologies in the hands of developers who don't necessarily have the machine learning understanding underneath that is required to do the complicated things that we're doing with ADA. What happens if a developer has that kind of gap in their knowledge and then they try and do something? Where What are the typical downfalls? What are the typical mistakes? I'll just use the IBM Watson service yeah. as an example. It kind of acts as a black box in that you, you pass it a query and you get a response. You can't always see the inner workings of the service, so you can't always determine what, what went wrong. But the, the service works in such a way that you can fine-tune the responses, the, the, the intents and the dialogue, so that over time it becomes more and more accurate. So when we started out on this journey, we had a simple bot that could say hello, it didn't know your name, it didn't have any of your campus data set. And what we've learned is over time, as you feed it more and more information, more and more knowledge, different intents and the masses of dialogue that we have in there, sometimes it becomes more and more difficult to manage the accuracy of the response. So that was because of, of the breadth of information. Because of the breadth of information, okay, so you have conflicting. So it needs the breadth, but then at the same time, it becomes more complicated for it to pull out the right. Absolutely, parts. Yeah, absolutely. But even right. with, I think we have around twelve thousand questions and two thousand answers. It's still very accurate. Fantastic. I just want to add that. Once an institution's got a chatbot, the students and the teachers uh, need to test it regularly because information could come out to go out of date. But more importantly, they need to be able to be in a position where they can explain the behaviour of the bot. So, for instance, uh, can they explain to a student or a teacher why it came to a particular decision, why it's mm. presenting that data or that advice or that guidance to the teacher or to the student. So uh, explainable AI is crucial. And also as well, ethics comes into it all as well. And we need to make sure that the bot behaves uh, in a manner that reflects the ethics and the morals of the campus. So for instance, Bolton, we're very proud of our staff in the way they support our students. Mm -hmm. And we're we're an inclusive college. And we've got to make sure that Ada, our our digital assistant, reflects our ethos and the morals and ethics of the institution at large. And if I was a college down the road and I, and I wanted a chatbot, can I come to you and you would help me build it? And were you partnering that way? We get lots of campuses up and down the country asking us for advice and guidance. Yeah. But we're not the only uh, source of technical advice and guidance. A lot of the big vendors like Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Google and others have uh, chatbot platforms. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole bunch of uh, companies out there that will support your institution to develop a a chatbot. So if you go back five or ten years, those companies wouldn't have been available and those platforms wouldn't have been available. But come 2019, I think we're we're being spoiled for choice. Mm -hmm. And some of these bots that aren't contextualised, you can set up in a matter of minutes. So that's that's the exciting bit. The technology has matured and is readily available. And I think sooner or later, every child, every student every member of staff, every teacher will have will benefit from their own digital assistant. So one of my aspirations is that you could be three years old, starting preschool, nursery, you move from primary school to high school, high school to college and then to university or into work. And throughout your life, you are accompanied by your own personal digital companion who supports you with your studies. And you can imagine how that would actually impact and improve education for that student and for the teachers. That's quite exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, in a classroom setting, 
you'll have the teacher and the student and the member of the support team looking after the, uh, the learners. But now imagine that classroom scenario where a digital assistant is supporting and facilitating a teaching, learning and assessment. So AI or cognitive services should amplify uh, the work of a teacher and the support teams and of the student. And if it's used really, really well, then I think students will make better decisions and more informed decisions about the studies. And also when it comes to teachers and support teams, they'll present better advice and guidance and also make better decisions regarding their students as well. I think that's super interesting because then it becomes like, you know, who is behind that chatbot age three to, you know, Mm. cradle to the grave? Is it Google? Is it Bolton College? Is it DfE? Is it the OECD? Like, who is it? It's interesting because, first of all, we need a much larger debate and conversation because if these platforms exist and the Department for Education says we want it to be a fantastic project if we aim to have an additional assistant for every learner, regardless of age in the country, and if we have that additional assistant for every teacher in the country, regardless of institution, and if that was the DFE and the EdTech community's uh, desire, then I think some really interesting and encouraging conversations could be had, and I'm sure something practical could be done to, to enable that. Now, one of the things I, I always talk about is you could be a child in a primary school and you're about to move on to um, high school and you pass a key to the high school and the key opens up the doors to the data set to the high school. Mm-hmm. So you retain your digital assistant, but uh, that's been with you since you were three, before preschool. And that digital assistant has access to the entire knowledge set and data set at the high school. Yeah, and then as you progress from high school to college or to university, that same digital assistant accompanies you and carries on that support. Now, that's an interesting vision, and I'm sure one day it'll be realised. What kind of time frame do you think? Well, I think in our lifetimes it'll happen. Yeah. It has to. All we need is the different institutions to work together, to work collaboratively. All it boils down to our imagination uh, and our will to make it happen. AFTAB doesn't tend to allow us to say, no, that's impossible. Yeah. So there's a kind of expectation that we'll meet something. We'll have a dialogue and say, you know, is, is this worth the effort? Are there any ethical implications? Is it, is it going to be a priority for us? But when it comes up with these extreme ideas, we do t- tend to try to um, assist them. <laughs> that's brilliant. Well, thank you both so much. And it's been a pleasure to meet you both. Pleasure. Thank you very much. In my interview about Ada College, Aftab and Dean talked about the role of contextualised information to make chatbots a powerful aid in our lives. But what about contextualised information elsewhere? We all know the impact of personal networks on our life chances and particular career trajectories. I spoke to Connector Teach founder and CEO Priyanka Agarwal about learning contextualised and how we can help create those personal relationships. Hi, Sophie. So at Connect Teach, we run a network of experts. We have about 650 experts that have industry experience, teaching experience, and the motivation and the commitment to make time for teaching. And we connect them with higher education institutions to deliver adjunct lectures, webinars, guest lectures, case studies. The idea behind it is to bring industry participation through real events and foster relationship between academia and industry in a very easy way. Amazing. And so is, is any of it face to face or is it all online? No, it, can, it could be anything. It could be face to face. It could be online. It could be recorded content. OK, yeah. wonderful. And can you give us some examples of some of your mentors or which industries? Absolutely. So we've worked with universities like the UCL School of Management, Pearson College London, Imperial yeah. Business School, and connected them with experts like Martin Hamilton, who's a futurist at JISC, in okay. fact. Uh, we've connected them with the principal director at Accenture to, uh, to deliver an adjunct lecture on operations. Uh, we've connected them with experts from institutions ranging from Adidas to Hewlett Packard Enterprise um, to Google in an attempt to bring in industry relevant education in the classroom and industry participation for. And so for, for those universities listening in, I expect some of them have like a department where essentially that's their role or part of their role. How did Connect to Teach find a, a gap? What's not happening on the university side, which means that, you know, some of this is 
it's not as good as it could be for example so if you think about it some of the biggest companies in the world like google ibm starbucks they no longer require a degree for some of their top jobs mm-hmm. this is not only just a problem with young graduates it's also a problem that is with aging demographic that needs to upskill or reskill for jobs of the future so with the university ecosystem it becomes really important to develop courses that cater to this new student and sort of teaching new skills like digital marketing fintech cybersecurity and also new formats which could be online executive programs apprenticeship programs and the government in the uk has highly supported this through subject matter def uh, knowledge exchange frameworks apprenticeship programs etc so for anyone in the university ecosystem that wants to take the opportunity to actually develop this new program or deliver to this new audience connect to teach becomes a really easy way to access the expertise to sort of do everything from develop the curriculum deliver it use it to market their courses through co branding get guest lectures and uh, to host webinars to sort of uh, show the industry linkage between the course that they're delivering and what is actually being used in the industry. And how did you come to launch Connect to Teach? What's your background? Um, so I actually was in the industry. I work with companies like KPMG, Tavis Perrin in US and the Tata Group in India. And while leading teams, one of the biggest challenges I had was in finding the right mm. courses that I could get my teams to sort of upskill and learn some of the skills we were using. using at work and when i tried to bring in people i wasn't always sure that whether they knew it or not because it was individuals it wasn't university driven or branded by a high education institution and the courses weren't available at university level when i actually went to do my mba one of the things that really surprised me is that even though i was at you know a really great college which was teaching me some of some great things courses like supply chain and uh, one talking about hyperlocal delivery where that very morning shuttle got acquired by ebay and so the curriculum wasn't updated you know the professors were aware of what was happening in the industry and i saw that the gap had to be bridged but it had to be done in a very seamless way where both were interacting with each other over real opportunities versus just sort of talking in a forum like let's do more yeah and those connections were sort of only with senior administrators or senior lecturers it wasn't something that university wide anyone who wanted to be a champion of change bring in some sort of you know new programs or new formats in could not access the right experts to do that or even research to develop a case study they didn't necessarily have the right access so the idea was how do you create equal access for everyone within an organization and also across the world i spoke to ed fido from london interdisciplinary school yesterday i don't know if you're familiar with what they're doing but they are a new university he's setting up in london and he was very adamant that it had to be london because you do have that density of industry and expertise in one place that you can draw on but from what i understand so with what you're doing it could be a university anywhere because then you'll have different options whether it's online but you've got that bank of expertise to draw on absolutely um the one thing that he rightly said is that uk in general has that huge density and a large part of it comes from london so in fact a majority of our experts on connected each are from the uk but we connect them globally to institutions in the us singapore india australia also in addition to the uk I saw I remember this time last year in Dubai at the Next Billion Prize there was a mentoring company there and their argument was you've got aspiring data scientists say in a in a country where there isn't a university's doing a course on that there isn't the the kind of depth of expertise locally to sort of help that person envision going into that role so what they were doing is exactly that is is you know connecting that person so they could get an idea of what being a data scientist is all about like how is it day to day what's the culture of people who work in that sector which i think is very cool because otherwise you become defined by what's happening locally in a globalized world which then takes away some of these opportunities absolutely and i think another thing that it gives you is role models you understand that what what you will be like if you are in this role and if you you know for a lot of stem subjects for example a lot of women don't end up going in the subjects because they don't see role models they feel that how will i handle a life and i'm married and have kids and i'm doing this profession so i'm um, just just one example it could be about your know, different socio economic backgrounds also so i think allowing industry or people who are actually doing it to come in whether it's through small interventions like guest lecturing or through mentoring or through actually delivering lectures it solves some bigger problems around in a reducing dropout bringing diversity into the workspace um, making the subjects more approachable to students also there's so, such a big cost that you're taking of time and money when you choose a subject but if you're not really clear on what you're going to do with it and it's sort of just sitting in your notebooks at that point in time 
it's it's something really big that you're going to lose on today because the world is moving really fast. I remember when I graduated, I did really well in statistics, but I had no idea what I was learning. And when I got my first job, I had to use it to solve a sales problem. And I'm doing this regression analysis and I still remember being like, "Oh my god, this is what we were studying for four years." And I had no idea because I had not actually seen the application of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always refreshing when it's done in context so yeah why yeah. don't we do more of that so if people are listening in what's the kind of model that you work to is it a subscription model how does that work so we have both we have a pay-as-you-go model subscription model what we ask people to do is always come in with a pay-as-you-go model which allows you to come in post how many of opportunities you would like on the network we only charge after a successful match once you actually see the match you see that the value that it brings from bringing in that industry connect because it's not just just about improved learning outcomes by having more precise learning on those subjects in the classroom but also it connects to engagement goals enrollment goals by co-branding with the expert also employability goals because you're opening a network that the mm-hmm. students can each easily reach out to for jobs and we're finding ways now to actually connect it back because we've seen that requirement from coming in from corporates so once you actually match and you see the value then we've seen that you know it makes sense to you also to move to subscription model and sort of bring experts on an ongoing basis through the platform and do you pay the experts as well yeah Yes. So the institutions usually have that budget where they're bringing in experts anyways, but they're sort of doing it either from their personal network or, you know, asking someone to ask somebody. Yeah, um, yeah. Or uh, lots of times we see these positions posted on job portals and then being com- vacant for years because the person you're looking for is not a job seeker. He's an no. expert mm-hmm. and there's no way you can find him on a job portal. So a lot of times positions stay vacant. So through Connected Teach, actually, you're, you know, you're actually filling in that gap and getting a high value from it for the same budget and how long have you been running for and what's like the next six months look like what are you going to focus on there Uh, we've been running for about two years we've been in the market for a little over a year we work with almost all the top universities I think within the UK and US and Singapore like I mentioned not all in the US but yes Um, the next six months for us is about actually connecting the experts to also connect create content that the universities can push through as part of their curriculum so not not just live delivery and synchronous mm-hmm. delivery, but also actually creating some content that they can push through. And especially for a lot of students today, there's a combination of online learning and offline learning, even though if you're an on-campus student. Mm-hmm. And I think that online learning is a lot of actually discovering what is it that you want to do? What does this actually do? You know, that's how our brain works. We see something we don't know. We try to look it up. But a lot of that content is missing from the internet. So if an understanding's credibility is also missing. So it's about creating some of that the students can access more easily amazing another thing we started doing this year is actually mentoring Um, but we don't do one-on-one mentoring but group mentoring Mm -hmm. because our requirements we started getting from universities and their online divisions was that how can we actually hold hands with the student on a week-on-week basis to keep them engaged keep their profiles up with employers and make sure they're working on real life projects and that's some of the work that our experts are now starting to do is that going out to industry and actually experiencing the environment there or how would that work? So it's actually the industry either defining the project or the student defining the project and connecting with industry and then industry sort of guiding them through those projects and then using that projects as a segue to into employment. Okay, wonderful. And if people want to find out more, connect with you and explore a bit further, what's the best way for them to do that? So they can go on connectedteach.com or otherwise they can always write to me at priyanka at connectedteach.com. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. This week's episode looks at the development of personal curriculums, some nudged and encouraged by chatbots, others buoyed by industry experts. But in this age of hyper-personalization, How do we disconnect from our own personal curriculums of pressure, expectation and fear of failure? EdTech entrepreneur John Katzman previously talked on the EdTech podcast about universities being expected unfairly to bear the cost of support for students. Whilst another past guest stressed that some personal curriculum approaches were too isolationist, stating, we don't want students all alone in their own cubby holes. So how do we support students in the age of the nudge of the online dopamine hit and being hyper-connected whilst deeply lonely. How do we make personal curriculums align with our personal values? I spoke to past on-campus GP, Dr. Dominique Thompson, about just this to round off this week's episode. 
Okay, great. I'm here with Dominique Thompson, who is the director of Buzz Consulting. So welcome, Dominique. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for adjusting your plans to be on the podcast recording. No worries. I wanted to connect, really, we tend to get very excited about the new technologies that are coming along, whether it's artificial intelligence or virtual reality or whatever it might be, without perhaps or feeling slightly embarrassed about delving into some of the more tricky connotations of what that might mean for us as learners and and people. So what are you seeing with regards to the mental health of students in this kind of world of new technologies, fast change and different pressures on students? Mm. I think I notice technology play a part in their lives in two ways um, and I'm happy to talk about both. The first way is where it is obviously an everyday part of the scene they live in, the world around them, the wallpaper of their lives. So that's the social media side of things, it's how they feel they have to be on show, it's where they have to demonstrate how good they are at different things and and, and I think it can have an impact for them in terms of highlighting things like perfectionism but it's also great for their social lives and we want people to be connected to each other and they are politically engaged through it so there are pros and cons on that side of things and then there's technology being used more for well-being in terms of delivering support so whether it's through websites or online Uh, interventions so people can get you know counseling and that might be face to face so a video type of connection or it might be literally typing in how you feel and then someone typing back there are some amazing apps out there I declare an interest in that I've helped develop some of them but they are free to download there's no cost involved and they are on the NHS library so they are approved for example for self-harm or for student well-being generally. So I think, you know, you you might go to a website like a Student Minds website, charity website, which has lots of great information for young people. You might download apps uh, and you might access through technology some counselling or some support. So I think, you know, technology plays an enormous part in young people's lives, most of it for the good, but we do need to be aware of the downsides. And and what's kind of your background? What how did you get to this point and yeah. and speaking at the GFS today? Yes. So my background is as a GP. So I spent uh, almost 20 years in a university seeing students mm. day in day out every 10 minutes seeing another student. I got very interested in mental health, mainly because I was seeing so much of it, as is the case all over the UK, but also because I felt uh, really keen to find out more about how we could help students with mental health problems. I then started working at a strategic level. I've worked with Universities UK. I've done a TEDx talk, which is called What I Learned from 78,000 Consultations (laughs) with Students. So it gives you some sense of, you know, this sort of bigger picture. And now I write books um, for students and I'm just about to write a book for parents as well about looking after and supporting and developing independent and resilient young people. Fantastic. 78,000 consultations. At least. That was a rough estimate. (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's pretty impressive. People argue, oh, well, you know, people are just reporting it more. So do you feel that that's the true case or do you feel that there is a a kind of shift in more people experiencing mental health issues and why that might be as well yes it's a it's a very reasonable question to ask are we just talking about this more the answer is no all over the world the usa australia canada malaysia all sorts of countries are noticing this rise in young people suffering from distress from anxiety from also mental health disorders when you look at the actual statistics so i'm talking about nhs hospital admission statistics i'm talking about surveys such as the adult psychiatric morbidity survey which is done in the whole population every seven years we are seeing a genuine increase in the number of cases of common mental health disorders, eating disorders, and so on. So there's no doubt we are talking about it more, which I think is a good thing in that we are now less stigmatized. And if people need help, they can ask for it and so on. But we are also seeing, sadly, a genuine rise in distress, stress, and mental health disorders. Well, the big question, so why do you think that is the case? You know, is there any kind of consensus on why this might be? There is starting to be some research, which I have tried to pull together myself out of interest. I've spent the last year and a half looking at why this might be, because when you're seeing students day in, day out, you know, you're looking after them, you're sort of firefighting, but also 
at the front line, you, you haven't in a way got the brain space uh, to think about the why. So I've spent a lot of time uh, since I left clinical practice thinking about the why and bringing that together. And so my TED talk, the, the talks I give, they are all about the hyper competitiveness of our society now, that it has radically changed from 20, 30 years ago, that we have seen a massive rise in perfectionism measured in the population, in young people, in students over the last 30 years, that we are much more target driven, that more people go to university, which means more people with a degree, which means more competition in the workplace. We are definitely seeing problems, um, you know, as I said, with social media, because it is a magnifying glass, because it makes these things worse, like perfectionism and com competitiveness, it isn't in itself necessarily bad. We just have to learn how to use it and when it's good for us, when it's not. Much as over the years we have learned about, say, alcohol, you know, there are good points, bad points. We have to be in moderation. I think this is really interesting because I, I guess I, I would categorise myself in the sort of young family space. And when I chat with my parents about, you know, among our friends, it's suddenly, you know, there's such a eagerness to consume every new book or idea about how to bring up children mm. or... And maybe that's been the case. But I think before people were just kind of like, well, there was a school there, so my child just went to that school. And it is kind of like, you know, you feel like you're project managing the next generation from even before they're born like yes. and and that it's a bit sad isn't it well you're not alone in feeling that that's one of the reasons that I've started to look much more at that I think parenting itself has become competitive to an extent you know I think people feel a pressure to do it right uh, but they're not sure what right is and we've only really had parenting experts for the last 30 or so years in our generation so our parents generation there was no real such thing you know there was no marker of what was good or bad it was more just about how your kids turned out so I I think if we can have a bit of insight and take a little bit of a step back, we will recognise that that's happening. There are things parents can do to try and perhaps minimise the risk of mental health issues or of well-being issues or of stress and distress and how young people manage stress. Because stress per se is not bad. We mm. need a bit of stress to focus the mind, to get that adrenaline going before you give a talk or a presentation or write a project. But we don't want sort of toxic stress. We don't want chronic stress going on all the time that makes us ill. So I think the idea is really as a generation, perhaps what we can do, you know, as young parents, I also have a, a nine-year-old, I think is to think about what we can do for them in terms of life skills. What do we teach them for life that will help them so that when they do meet a bump in the road, they don't panic, they can deal with it. But also that is not going to happen if as parents, mm. we snowplow for them, we go in front of them, we remove all the barriers, all the obstacles, we try and make their life as easy as possible, inverted commas, because actually life isn't easy. We need to know how to manage those problems. And just finally, because I know then you have to dash for the train, you spoke here this morning, but what were the kind of key takeaways? I, I expect everyone was sat in the audience, mental health and higher education is, is a huge issue. It comes up time and again. Did you have any kind of, these were my suggestions for you or as the audience at Digifest that you can share with the listeners here? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things I always say is when you're, you know, doing events or creating things for students to participate in, ask yourself the question, does this need to be competitive? Because so much of their lives is competitive competitive. Can we do things that are for fun, for education, to try a new skill? So that's one thing I'm really keen on is, you know, if you're, if you're having a, an event to get them to know each other, sort of, you know, which is brilliant, building social bridges and connections, don't make any of it competitive mm. make it fun you know help them to build those connections because I think that is a really important bit of being human is human to human contact we need to be able to talk to others and we're not always very good at that so I was very keen on that side of things I suppose I talked a bit about parental involvement and that parents are more involved these days and perhaps we need to help parents to take a step back for example they don't need to go to open days Young people need to be able to get up, get on a train, go to an open day, see if they like the place and come home again. 
it's nice to do stuff together as a, as a parent and a child or a student, but I don't think that that is one thing they have to do together. You can do other stuff together. So I think, you know, ask yourself the questions, whether you're as parents, teachers, lecturers, does this have to be competitive? And also um, try not to do things for young people. Let them do it for themselves and, and work their way out of it. Another top tip, just perhaps my last one, is about let is, you know, children, young people, and then young adults are terrified of failing. Okay, they view failure as absolutely beyond the pale. They really worry about letting people down. So do what you can to frame things so that when things go wrong and they don't succeed because they won't always, they're okay with that. They learn that sometimes things go wrong. They're not always going to be okay. And share with them examples, for example, of when, you know, things didn't go well for you. You know, if, if you're a parent, then tell them about, oh, actually, I went for a job interview and actually I didn't get it. And, you know, when you're okay with it, be okay with it. Tell them about it. Don't share every disaster with them. It's not about making them really feel depressed and negative from that, but just let them know that things don't always work out, but actually you can bounce back. And it's that that's really important for them. Fantastic. Well, I feel like I've, I've learned loads myself, so I'm going to uh, use all of no, that, my no pleasure. doubt. How can people follow what you do on Twitter or? Yes, of course. So I'm on Twitter quite a lot at Dr. Dom Thompson. And um, on there, you'll sort of be able to see my books when they come out or the TEDx talk. I'm doing another one in, in April. And then my website is www.buzzconsulting.co.uk if anyone wants to just see what I'm all about. Thank you so much. Thank and you. good luck with the train. Thank you. That's all for this week. I hope if you're thinking about personal curriculums and what this means to you, this episode has been helpful. If you want any failures to help your students be okay with the bumps in the road, I've got an absolute ton I can share. Or go and listen to the How to Fail podcast by Elizabeth Day, which is absolutely great on exactly this topic and makes me feel immediately better about my own shortcomings. Don't forget, if you'd like to leave a message for our next episode, you can go to speakpipe at speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast and leave a 90 second voicemail. You can also continue the conversation online at hashtag edu4 underscore zero at JISC or at podcast EdTech on all the social medias. Thanks also to my guests and you for listening. All the show notes, it's the EdTechPodcast.com. Have a great week. Enjoy and goodbye.